is Nurse J at Nursing the Truth, and I hope everyone is having a great day. So, I hope everyone liked my video yesterday talking about how the Egyptians were called your Christians, the Therapeutae. I made a video about this a long time ago, but kind of wanted to refresh and rejog some memories. So, um, as you know, Eusebius uh, wrote this in his History Ecclesiastica. Um, and citing Philo of Judea. Um, Philo said this group was a very aesthetic group and um, they had men and women in their group and they um, led a very plain lifestyle. These people were very rich, gave away their possessions and left family behind, wives, children, you name it lived on water and bread and drank no wine and did not eat any flesh. They were vegetarians or vegans, whatever you want to call them. And so this group was out of Alexandria, but they were well known throughout the ancient world in Greek and Rome as well. So, since I am a nurse by trade, I came across something last night and I thought I would kind of, you know, share this with you. Um, it's an interest to me and maybe um, if by chance you are a doctor or a nurse or medical assistant or CNA or whatever, or even in the healthcare profession alone, you might want to think about this. So, I laid the groundwork about the therapeutic. So, let's talk about the Asclepius cult that was known from all the Asclepius temples and the Asclepius cult, they say around 500 BCE to 500 CE. Now, Let's think about this. If Christianity was the main religion, then what are the temple or why is the temple of Isis opened and was not shut down until about 541? And why is the Sclepius temples open? up until 500 or so. Isn't that, quote, pagan? Okay, so moving on. The ancient Greco-Roman medicine borrowed a lot from the Egyptian medicine. How true that is. Egyptian medical men were invited by Greeks to practice medicine in their countries and were highly respected. Michael Grant, in his well-respected The Rise of the Greeks book, makes note that the cult of Thoth Hermes and its equivalent, Asclepius Amhotep, was the main intellectual belief during the time of Pythagoras. Wow. Thoth, Hermes, try majestus, thrice great, rocks again. So then we have Apollo. Apollo was considered the earliest Greek god of medicine, but he was also a sun god too. And Apollo was born in Delos and brought up until Delphi. Here, as the legend goes, the infant Apollo slew a python or a monster that had plagued the site. Following this, Delphi became a sacred place in Greece where oracles occurred. Apollo is regarding as having taught the art of healing to Achilles, Sclepius, and Jason. Jason of the Argonauts. And if you watch the movie Immortals, it talks about the sibling oracles and, you know, you hear about the oracles of Delphi. 
You hear the oracles in Egypt and Memphis. Now we have Scalapius was considered to be the son of Apollo and a mortal woman. Ancient written sources report that, the, that he healed many sick whose lives had been despaired of and brought back to life many who died. Let me uh, get this from my dog. Hold on, guys. Sorry, this Jack Russell was playing with this bottle. No, you may not have the bottle. Okay, so moving on. Major temples and shrines and healing centers were scattered across the empire according to the ancient sources. Perhaps the best resource available on the Escalapius cult in the empire is located. Um, and this information I got off of mountainman.com.au. You may look this up for yourself. So it gives a list of where all of these temples and shrines are located, guys. So I'm going to read a handful of where these temples are were located. Messenia, Algana, uh, the Ptolemaic Egypt, Argolos, um, Lydia, Arcadia, um, I'm trying to get some that I can say. Focus. And Thessalonica. So these things are everywhere. Now it even tells you, you know, that these writers wrote about these things, like Herodotus, Plato, Strabo, uh, Philostratus, Ovid, Cicero, Pliny the Elder, Seneca. I mean, so they all knew about this stuff. Pythagoras, um, he was a mathematician and a physicist, and he had a profound influence on medicine. Finally, the Jack Russells in the kennel. Lay down. Y'all are going to have to help me with this dog. And um, Sophocles. Now, Listen to this, guys. Now, Sophocles was in 496 to 406 BC. The life tells us that Sophocles served as a priest to Scalapius, god of healing and medicine. In the center of Scalapius' temple lived a great serpent, an embodiment of the god himself. Once, during the relocation of the temple to Athens, Greece, the snake lived in Sophocles' house till his new quarters were ready. Wow, Inky was busy. Hippocrates, 460 to 370 BCE. Generally considered the father of medicine. You know, I like how that is generally considered. An astute Greek physician who was born on the island of Kos, but probably practiced in Rhodes. He was the first to maintain records of his patients, complaints, and his own observations. It was Hippocrates who enunciated the physician's oath known as the Hippocratic Oath. He was the first to maintain records of his patients' complaints. Well, let's go back to the Ebrus Papyri. Thousands of years before Greek ever knew what the hell was going on, and they found this papyri of the ills, what could have been, and what they did for it. So, you make up your own mind. Who was first? 
it was Egypt. The Greeks came into Egypt that was already an ancient civilization and learned from them. But you see, the Greeks, when they conquered and took everything, they put a spin on it and sold it. And the Romans came in and took what the Greeks had, what the Greeks learned from the Romans, and they put their spin on it. Then it is what it is. And that's my new term. I'm going to get a t-shirt. I'm going to put it is what it is. And some of his famous sayings, Hippocrates says, in every disease, it is a good sign when the patient's intellect is sound and he enjoys his food. The opposite is a bad sign. Well, true, that's a nice keen observation, Doc. Even a nurse can tell you that. So, Life is short and the art long. Opportunity is fleeting. Experience fallacious. Judgment is difficult. So, and then I said about Philo of Judea on the ascetics. And he, it is evidence on the writings of Seneca, Epictetus, and others. Philosophy in the West ceased to purely speculative and dealt with moral and religious questions. The tendencies toward the moral and religious was strengthened by the spread of Jewish and Christian teachings. Now, we're not talking about the orthodoxy. We are talking about the ascetics and the Gnostics. Together with the development of the Neoplatonist towards mysticism and the consequent mingling of Western and Eastern thought, Philo lived in Alexandria, Egypt from 20 BCE to 40 AD. Quote, unquote, he was a Jew in religion, but a Greek in philosophy. But you see, they were saying that he was a Christian, quote, unquote, Eusebius. is such a liar. You know, the selection... Below describes the pre-Christian ascetics of Egypt, and it is important because it shows the asceticism was common in the deserts of Egypt even before the Christian months, and thus by no means peculiarly Christian. And he goes on to talk about that, which was pretty pretty lengthy. Um. Now, on the coinage of the Roman Empire, <laughs> 54 CE to 324 CE. Now, the Edict of Milan in 313, I think, where they were allowing this Christianity like this Gnosticism, Therapeutai, and all that to be mingled in with the pagans, quote, whatever. And so now we have coins, but wait. I thought it was an orthodoxy back then already. Asclepius, the god of medicine, indicates that the 46 of the Roman emperors for the period of almost three centuries depicted on their many coins the figure of Asclepius. This represents a fairly extensive and persistent tradition. Notably, the practice ceases in the year 324, at which time the military supremus Constantine secured the Roman Empire as his own. At this time, the ignorant Constantine destroyed the temples of Scalapius and had their chief priest executed. For the details, see the article on the Council of Antioch. These 
are some of the emperors who depicted Scalapius on their coins. Nero, Galba, Vespasian, Titus, Domitia, Trajan, Hadrian, Sabina, Antonius Pius, Faustina, Marcus Aurelius, and so on and so forth. The Commodus, the nut job, and all that. Now, Pliny the Elder in his natural history says to the west of the Dead Sea, of the Dead Sea, the Essenes have put the necessary distance between themselves and the shore. They are a people unique of its kind and admirable beyond all others in the world, without women and renouncing love entirely, without money and having for company only palm trees. Owing to the throng of newcomers, this people is daily reborn in equal number. Indeed, those whom worry by the fluctuations of fortune. Life leads to adopt their customs, stream in great numbers. This unbelievable, they may seem for thousands of centuries, a people, now listen about the, uh, the Essenes, and you know, this also could be a branch off of uh, Judaism. Well, it is. It's a branch of Judaism or off the shoot of that. But could it be Akhenaten, Swayze? Thus, unbelievable though this may seem for thousands of centuries, a people has existed which is eternal yet, into which no one is born so fruitful for them is the repentance which others feel for their past lives. Now Josephus, he says, which we have to take Josephus with a grain of salt. And he talks about Herod and the Essenes. And he protected the Essenes. He says, the Essenes also, as we call a sect of ours, were excused from the imposition. These men lead the same kind of life as do those whom the Greeks call Pythagoreans. So Herod was pretty cool with them. And so I'm not going to read this big old thing there. Oh, now, this is one of my favorites. 95 CE, Apollonius of Tyana. Man, he rocks. You hear me? I love Apollonius of Tyana. You must read the book um, by Philostratus about his life. Interesting, interesting. Um, the treatise is mentioned by Philostratus who tells us that is that it set down the proper method of sacrifice to every god. The proper hours of prayer and offering, it was wide in circulation. And Philostratus had come across copies of it in many temples and cities and in the libraries of philosophers. Several fragments of it have been preserved the most important of which is to be found in Eusebius in his preparation of the Evangelion. Okay. Now, think about this, guys. Nowhere in Josephus' writings, which lived at the same time as Apollonius of Tyana, he says nothing of him. But Apollonius of Tyana has met with the Roman emperors and even gave oracles, even gave oracles to Vespasian and Titus. And even got sent to Rome. And they didn't like his teachings either. So in this that Eusebius had. You know, Eusebius went everywhere. 
And the Library of Alexandria was still going when Eusebius was alive. Didn't get burned until 461, I believe. So he had everything at his fingertips. And think about this, guys. If Rome conquered Egypt in 30 BCE when Cleopatra was the last pharaoh, do you not know how much information or how much pilfering and stealing they did before they burned it down? And where all of it is housed right now? Something to think about. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't think, and that's the problem. So it says that in this Eusebius book, it says, um, quote, unquote, from Apollonius of Tyana, "'Tis best to make no sacrifice to God at all, no lighting of a fire, no calling him by any name, that men employ for things to sense. For God is over all the first, and only after him do come the other gods, G-O-D-S, plural. For he doth stand in need of naught, even from the gods much less from us small men. Not that the earth brings forth nor any life she nurses, or even anything the stainless air contains. The only fitting sacrifice to God is man's best reason, and not the word that come from out his mouth. We men should ask the best of beings, though the best thing in us, for what is good, mean by means of mind, for mind needs no material things. So then to God, the mighty one who's over all, no sacrifice should ever be lit up. How do you like that? Stick it in your pipe and smoke it. And you want to know why they don't like Apollonius? Because he came in with a new doctrine. It says that the scholarship is convinced of the genuineness of this fragment. This book, as we have seen, was widely circulated and held in the highest respect and it is said that its rules were engraved on brazen pillars at Byzantinum. Wow. <coughs> so, medical people, hope you're enjoying this, because I sure am. In 150 CE, here we go. Christianity's still rocking, right? Orthodoxy Christianity still rocking? Okay. Provides a comprehensive catalog. This is Pausanias in the second century. Provides a comprehensive catalog of temples and shrines in the region as well as frequent discussions of local myth and cult practice. His descriptions of ancient Greece makes a total of 126 separate references to the name of Scalapius, the popular hero of physical healing. Sorry guys, I'm gonna have to let this phone go. Every time I do a video, there's something going on. 160 CE, Aristotides. Archaeological data supplement the literary sources on the Asclepion of Pergamon, including the most extensive one, Sacred Tales. 
mention of therapeutai, the temple worshipers or servants. Aristides writes, we, Asclepius therapeutai, must agree with the God that Pergamum is the best of his sanctuaries. Scalapius is the one who guides and rules the universe, the savior of the whole and the guardian of immortals. Or if you wish to put it in the words of a tragic poet, the steerer of government. He who saves that which always exists and that which is in the state of becoming. Publius Elias Aristides says, a sophist and a rhetorician, educated at Pergamon and Athens, widely traveled in Egypt and Asia Minor, arriving at Rome in 156, spent most of his time as a patient at the Escalapium at Pergamon, a friend of Marcus Aurelius. He became a priest of Escalapius at Smyrna. More than 50 of his orations and declarations are extant. 165, Claudius Gallon of Pergamon. Gallon use of the designation therapeutai to secure from Marcus Aurelius exemption from military service. This physician Galen was a private physician to Marcus Aurelius that was a good general, an emperor. <clears throat> in Galen's books, in his writings, he wrote 500 books. He often acknowledges his indebtedness to Hippocrates. Galen was a physician to the great philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius. He says, I know he said that I have often made a diagnosis from dreams and guided by two very dear dreams. I once made an incision into the artery between the thumb and index finger on the right hand, nor it seems was this a unique success. I have saved many people and Gallen goes on to say by applying a cure prescribed in a dream. Galen also put stress on the proper and frequent use of gymnastics, hence the importance and place of gymnasia. Throughout other ancient Greek medical writings, special exercises are prescribed as cures for specific diseases, showing the extent to which the Greeks considered health and fitness connected. A gymnasium was equivalent to our ideas of a university, a gathering place for scholars and their pupils, complete with a library. Porphyry in 300. An abstinence from animal blood. <laughs> and Carrera mean the Stoic, therefore, in his narration of the Egyptian priest, who he says, who considered by the Egyptian as philosophers, informs us that they choose temples as the places in which they might um, philosophize. For to dwell with the statues of the gods is a thing allied to the whole desire by which the soul tends to contemplate on their divinities. And from the divine veneration indeed, which was paid to them through the dwelling in temples, they obtained security, all men honoring these philosophers as they were certain sacred animals. And it gives a long uh, thing about that. So I'm not going to read that. So <clears throat> basically, it has some things about Hesod as well. In 310, Ambalicus on the Pythagorean on the Pythagorean way of life, they were. Um, he taught his disciples to avoid oaths. Um, he counseled against seeking revenge on doing harm to one's enemies. He did not. He did not wear wool, but he wore a white linen robe. He was a vegetarian and condemned animal sacrifices. He he told his friends to abstain from all animal blood and from wine. Hecabus three twenty three. <clears throat> Um, 
He, he also was sprung from the seven sects among the people like Simon, from whom came the Simonians, and Cleobus, from whom came the Calabians, and Dothius, who called the Dothians, and all these groups. Each introduced privately and separated, separate his own peculiar opinion. From them came false Christs, false prophets, false apostles, who divided the unity of the church by corrupt doctrines and uttered against God and against his Christ. Talking about Hexippus. From what Eusebius wrote. The same writer, Hexippus, also records the ancient heresies which arose among the Jews in the following words. They were, moreover, various opinions in the circumcision among the children of Israel. The following were those that were opposed to the tribe of Judah and the Christ, Essenes, Galileans, Hermiobaptists, Massabathinians, Samaritans, Sadducees, and Pharisees. Eusebius of Caesarea in 324, <coughs> excuse me, in the historical Ecclesiastica, he said that he said that Mark was the first that was sent to Egypt and that he proclaimed the gospel. And the multitudes of believers, both men and women, that were collected there at the very outset and lived the lives more philosophical and an asceticism. And talks about the therapeutic. But really, there's no um, artifacts about a mark. So I'm going to leave you this. The father of medicine, Hippocrates, all you doctors that want to take care of people. And you say that you will do everything in a ethical manner, a secretive manner for your patients. And if you are an Orthodox Christian, you have to say these things when you take your Hippocratic Oath. And this is the oath as follows. I swear by Apollo, the healer, not Jesus, invoking all the gods and goddesses to be my witness, that I will fulfill this oath and this written covenant to the best of my ability and judgment. I will look upon him who shall have taught me this art even as one of my own parents. I will impart this art by precept, by lecture, and by every mode of teaching. The regimen I adopt shall be for the benefit of the patient according to my ability and judgment, and not for their hurt or for any wrong. And my attendance on the sick are even part from there. Whatsoever things I see or hear concerning the life of men, which ought not to be spoken abroad, I will keep silence thereon, counting such things to be a sacred secret. So, I hope you've liked this video, especially my medical subscribers and friends, because I enjoy it. So, doctors, how do you feel taking an oath of allegiance to Apollo and all and invoking all gods and goddesses? Are you turning your backs on them and now you cannot heal because you don't call on them? Go back to the ancient ways and the ancient medical books if you can find any. But you see, that's the problem. You're giving us poison. You're not giving us the real earthly things that we need for our earthly bodies. So then, 
Until next time, hope tap and I shame, and I hope you like this video. Like, share, subscribe, hit your notification bell, and we'll see you on the next video, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.